Hey, what's up, y'all? This is Mr. KB. It is January 5th, 2016. Um, this is the first video you guys are watching. Happy New Year's. I hope you guys had a nice holiday break. If you're out of any country that celebrates Christmas or, I guess, traditional New Year's, I think China would probably be the only one, but I'm not sure, to tell you the truth. Um, the happy two weeks that I've been gone are happy. <laughs> I hope you guys had a nice weekend. Everybody has a weekend, right? So I hope you guys had a nice weekend. Um, so yesterday, yesterday, Monday? Yes, Monday. Yeah, York, the owner of the San Francisco 49ers, had a press conference talking about the future of the franchise, reflecting on this season, and I guess the failures of this season. The, he didn't really harp on any of the, I guess, what people would consider moral victories or whatnot. Um, so I always say I'm done talking about the Niners until whenever, and I, maybe I should stop saying that because this whole season I've been saying that, and pretty much on a weekly basis I've been here talking about the Niners. So I really should stop proclaiming um, that I'm going to stop talking about them because then they do something and I'm going to talk about them. So yesterday, I guess the biggest thing is Jim Tomsula is one and done. Uh, he was the man that followed uh, Jim Harbaugh, and that's it. He got one season to try to, I guess, match an 8-8 eight and eight season or try to improve on an 8-8 eight and eight season and was pretty much given a, a unfavorable position or an unfavorable situation. And unfortunately, he finished three games under his predecessor. Now, the, the, the vibe of this video, I, I want to kind of try to do it as positive as possible because this is the team that I, I truly do love. I really do love this team. There are very few things I am so detached from as far as any personal involvement that I really do love this much. Gaming is one, and 49ers is the other. Like, I, I truly, truly love this team. <laughs> so, we started off with that. Jim Tomsula's out. Again, I think he got kind of a bum rap. He was put in a bad situation, and it's very difficult for anybody and I'm going to say anybody. I don't think even bringing in some sort of mastermind coach like a Mike Shanahan or a, or a Holmgren or a Sean Payton if he was available or if you were able to take a – what's the dude's name from Alabama? Um, God, I hate him too. I can't even remember his name. Well, whatever, the head coach at Alabama, uh, Nick Saban. Nick Saban, if you were able to, to bring him from Alabama or you know get him away from Alabama, they'd have a way to succeed with – not only the talent that left, but the talent that got injured on this team, and just the situation in general. So Jim Tomsula is out. The one thing that I will say that I really hated about this this part of the press conference was I knew it was going to happen. I didn't want it to happen. I really did want Jim Tomsula to get another chance or yeah, sorry. Yeah, Jim Tom Sula get another chance to have a year removed from the drama, to have an offseason that was truly his own, to have more of a stamp to make to so we can gauge properly his abilities. I don't think you can gauge anybody properly given the situation that he was given. So I really wanted him to get one more year. Yes, they finished five and eleven. Yes, it's three games worse than they did last year. But I really wanted him to, to, to at least be given one more, one more year to, to, so we can gauge fully, not just knee jerk reactions to what we saw. I wanted him to get one more year. The one thing that bugged me was after, uh, Jed announced that they were releasing a coach from his contract is that he kept calling him Jimmy. Jimmy T, Jimmy, uh, you know, we've, we've had a long, you know, I, I've had a long relationship with Jimmy and we wish Jimmy nothing but the best and blah, blah, blah. I was like, look, Jed York is 38 years old. Coach Tom Sula is at least 20 years this man's elder. Now, maybe I'm a little different. Maybe I'm a little old school. I don't care how much money you have in this world, but if that's your elder, 
at least, at least show the man some respect and don't call him Jimmy. Don't refer to him as Jimmy. He's not your school, he's not your schoolyard chum. He's not your college friend. He's not anything in that regards to you. Either call him Jim Tom Sula or call him Coach Tom Sula and leave it at that. He kept referring to the man as Jimmy. Now, Jimmy is what you call your homie. It's what you call your buddy, your chum, your friend. And and it irked me. I don't know why it irked me. Maybe because I'm a little bit irked by him in general. But that irked me. The fact that he just kept calling him Jimmy. So It, it didn't fly with me. You know, I, I just didn't like that. He goes on to say, Jed York, um, that the season is on him. The failures of the season are on him. And that he takes full responsibility. Kudos, I guess. <laughs> you know, I mean, who who else are you really going to blame it on? Honestly, you fired a head coach that was really good. You let egos get in the way of that. You shipped the man off. You made him, you made his job difficult two seasons ago. He's now at Michigan where he proves that he can still coach. Took a borderlining Michigan college team to a what was it ten and three record or I know he had three losses but you know he he had a really solid improvement over last season pretty much what he did in San Francisco took a middling team and went to NFC Championship games and won Super Bowl one Super not won a Super Bowl one Super Bowl um, and that's what he did so I guess to that degree I'll give him some credit for him. At least putting that blame on himself. He wasn't looking for excuses. He, as much of, of, of manning up as you could do in that position at his young age for a person with that much money, at least he was able, even if he didn't mean any of it, because honestly, a lot of, a lot of what he says towards people positively, I find disingenuous. I don't think he means a lot of it. Now, if he does, he does, then that's on me for reading that incorrectly. But I really find him to be disingenuous. Um, but he did say that, and I will give him credit for actually saying that. He also, uh, later on in the interview, says that he, and he says he did it this season since I don't follow him on the Twitter. I don't really know if a lot of it has changed between last season and this season, or this this current past season. Where he's trying to not comment as much on Twitter. He's not trying to be so knee-jerk with his reaction, his comments on Twitter and social media like Facebook and whatnot. Because I know that caused a big a big uprising or a big uproar two seasons ago on Coach Harbaugh's last season there where... Trent Baalke's daughter got involved, and I believe he got involved, and they just kept saying things, and they kept mentioning things on social media about the the coaching and this and that, and, you know, it leads to more distractions. So, again, he's aware of that situation. He's aware of what his presence in those media outlets actually entail or can actually do to the team, even though he doesn't mean it. At least he's aware of that to not do that in the future. He said that he cut back on that this season again i don't follow him on twitter i really don't care about any personnel up in the suit area as i like to call it of the san francisco 49ers so if he was able to kind of step away and just kind of be the owner just be content with being the owner and have minimal contact or you know like just not really argue back and forth or have these type of knee-jerk reactions on social media, then good for him again. I'm going to give him kudos on that as well. Um, he did go on to say that Trent Baalke will remain general manager and that Trent Baalke and his staff do have all the resources available to make this team a winning team again. Here is where I'm going to have another issue. Tren Balky can draft. The, the, the man from the time he's been in San Francisco has been able to do two things correctly. He's been able to amass a crap ton 
of draft picks every year that he's been there. He's been able to negotiate a lot of draft picks in every single draft that he's been involved in. And I'll give him credit because out of those drafts, you know, you, you have to assume that the draft is like a lottery. That, yes, college kids are talented. They have the talent to succeed at a college level, but that doesn't necessarily translate into superstar talent at the pro level. So the way that I feel Trent Baalke kind of evens or kind of makes sure that he does get the talent is that he looks for that talent and he makes sure that he tries to get as much of that talent as possible. Every team, I believe, is allowed seven picks by default because you get one for each round. There are seven rounds. I believe during the Trent Baalke GM era of the Niners, they've been averaging 10 to 11 draft picks every draft. Not that they've used them all, but they've had that many. So, I mean, if, you know, if, if the average of you drafting a college talent that two out of the seven will be successful, you know, you give your chance to get three or four. I mean, the averages don't kind of play out that way, but you, you give your chance to get three or four successful talents if you draft 10 or 11 people or 10 or 11 players. Um, but I don't know if the loyalty to Trent Baalke, I don't know what their professional and, per, and personal relationship is. And I think that's the part that kind of bugs me is that it seems that Trent Baalke some, somehow has some sort of secret about Yed York or he has some sort of something about that family. Because I don't understand the actual loyalty there. Is that you're willing to let go of a great head coach in Coach Harbaugh because he doesn't stroke the ego of you, the owner, and you, the GM, or or your GM and your your GM who is trembalking. Now, when it comes to you being the owner and the coach is not stroking your ego, who cares? You sign his paycheck. You don't need your ego stroke because no matter what he tells you, at the end of the day. You're signing his paycheck. So if that's me, I'm going, well, talk all the crap you want. At the end of the day, you still my bitch. And I signed a check and here you go. I mean, that's just gonna be, that's gonna be me pulling it bluntly. It's simply like that. If he can't get along with your GM, make him work it out. Have him fight. Have him argue. Have him do whatever. But as long as you're winning, and that's what they were doing for the first three seasons, they were winning. The minute you decide to take a side, which it seems like, and it still appears that you took your GM side, guess what winded up happening? They winded up losing. Eight and eight, hardball's out. You bring in who many considered a yes man and coach Tom Sula. And we saw what happened there. You gave the GM what apparently he wanted and a man who would not conflict with his interest, a man who would not I guess maybe not stroke his ego, but at the same time not argue and not undermine him in every waking turn. And we saw what happened there, 5 and 11. So you can draft all the talent that you want. That's all fine and dandy. You can draft, you know, the top talent in every round of of the draft during April. But if you don't have a head, a head coach that can take that talent to the next level, then what are you really doing? And a lot of that has to follow the GM. The GM needs to know his place in the franchise. The GM's, the GM is the personnel guy. He is basically your HR guy. He's looking for the talent. He's recruiting the talent. He's signing the talent. He's letting you know where the talent is, but you need somebody. You need a manager, a head coach to make your team run efficiently. And that's what a good head coach does. And you saw what happens on both ends. And in both instances, the reason why that happens is because you took the side of the GM. And the both and both times you decided to give the GM what he wanted because he was so smart, led to losing led to losing seasons. And eight and eight is a losing season. I don't care how you look at it. No playoffs, losing season. And then 
I guess they he went on to further say, you know, they have all this cap room. I think they're like number four, number five left or top four or five with remaining head cap. I believe that headroom will actually be exceeded a little bit more if, with in my opinion, they wind up releasing Kaepernick. I don't think Kaepernick will be back. So if that's the case, they'll have even more room. I didn't know there were actually they had that much room left in in um that much cap room left in their actual salary cap to make moves. I just assumed they were out because they gave Kaepernick that big old deal. But apparently now with Patrick Willis leaving and a bunch of people leaving, they had a lot of cap room. And I guess that's good for next season, going to next season. If there are some, I don't know who's actually free that they can actually get though. Um, they do have a lot of room to, to make things happen. And let me see, what else did he say? I'm trying to find out what he said here. Because I only saw this thing one time. And even though I'm trying to make this positive, I focus a lot on the negative stuff and the negative aspects of it. So Trent Balky will be there. They haven't given any mention of who the next head coach is going to be. He pretty much said, you know, it's going to be competitive. And we don't want to tip our hand to who we're chasing, which, in my opinion, is very smart. You don't want to give your opponents, who is the other 31 teams, a a chance to snatch away the coach that you want because there are teams that would do that if they're in line for a coach like hey well they want them just take them first because if they want them why don't we want them and and go as far he did actually say because there were questions during this interview or during the press conference where everything that i'm saying was actually questioned to him as far as like does he regret letting go of harbaugh does he feel uh, does he have any, I guess, oh, how do they know that Trent Baalke is actually going to succeed? Because they let go of Harbaugh because of Trent Baalke. And then, you know, he was the 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 very antagonistic type of, 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 of character. And then they gave him basically a yes man in Tom Sula and they didn't succeed. So how can... How can Trent Baalke be trusted in making sure that the next head coach is the right head coach? And again, he didn't, Yad York at this point didn't really take any sides. He just kind of referred, well, I trust him and, you know, we believe, blah, blah, blah. He didn't really say that, he didn't really place blame on what has happened on Balky. He tried to make everything centered towards him, all the negative, everything towards him, and tried to keep everything, I guess, centered, which is a very smart move. Um, in my opinion, as much as I don't, I'm not gonna say I hate Trent Balky, but as much as I guess there's no there's no trust in Balky from me as a fan, it, it's a very smart move to just keep everything on yourself as the owner. Because I mean, honestly, you signed the checks, you're the billionaire. Who really cares what anybody thinks about you, really? Um. The one other thing that I really did not like when he mentioned Trent Baalke was like, the, well, Trent Baalke is very trusted. He's very, he's one of the best and he's respected amongst all his colleagues and he has experience um, building championship teams. Now, I Googled this man, Trent Baalke, that is. I Googled this man. He spent years as a New York Jets scout, as a Washington Redskins scout, and finally got, I guess, his big, his big career break being here with the Niners. I don't recall any of those teams in the last 15 years winning a championship. Not the Jets, not the Redskins. Definitely not the Niners, because I remember that one. To proclaim something like that, to say that this man has experience. Look, going to the Super Bowl is one thing. Winning a Super Bowl is another they didn't win. They went to one. They didn't win. So does he have experience building good teams? I'm going to say yes. Under proper coaching. When you have somebody like Harbaugh there, the talent that he drafts has the potential to make it to NFC Championship games, to Super Bowls. Potentially could have won that one. But he doesn't have any experience building championship teams. There's a difference there, Mr. York. I won't even call you Mr. 
Even though I want to call you something else. I'm going to call you Mr. York. And a lot of the questions were really just centered about trying to find out who the next coach is. Who, um, if there's any, and a lot of questions came up about Harbaugh and what Harbaugh tweeted. I guess, uh, Harbaugh had tweeted out something about do not be deceived, you reap what you sow or something along the, something along the ways right after, uh, the Niners won and everything, you know, kind of fell to crap at 5 11. I mean, it fell to crap like a month ago or two months ago, let's be honest. But, you know, he tweeted something and, you know, uh, yeah, York for us. For trying to turn this new leaf, I guess, this season, he said, oh, I can't really worry about what happens to social media. Either. So, again, I don't find the man genuine at all. I, I believe he's very disingenuous. But for doing what he did, I think he played all the cards right from from his aspect of it, from his end of it. I believe he played all the cards right. He placed all the blame on himself. He showed confidence in his GM. Again, whether or not that confidence is actually genuine, he showed confidence in him. So it sets a tone with head coaches. It sets a tone with personnel you're trying to attract to your franchise to have confidence in your staff. And as far as the coaching staff goes, Everybody who is already there, as far as the o, the OC, the, the the DC, all the position coaches, all of those um, coaches still have their positions. Actually, only Jim Tom Sula got let go. So the next head coach actually has the option of keeping that team's coaching staff in place if he can work with them. And again, another smart move. I don't know if it was his move or Trent, or Trent Balky's move to actually do that. Because one of my big things that I've been proclaiming since pretty much, I guess, the rumor that Tom Sula would be gone is that there needs to be stability in, in that team. There needs to be some sort of stability. Now, I'm not saying that the next head coach is going to keep all these guys. He can very well fire the offensive coordinator and the defensive corner and maybe even some other positioning coaches. But let's just say from 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 the most ideal situation is you get somebody like say a Sean Payton. Right? He had probably one of the worst defensive coordinators in in, in St. Louis. We didn't really fare much better in defense this year and particularly like out of the last four years having a top five, top ten defenses, this year the Niners were in the bottom five. <laughs> like, literally, I looked it up, and I was like, oh, my God, I thought they were better than this. Um, but, no, they weren't. They really weren't. Um, so, ideally, I would like the new head coach to kind of try to keep everybody and make things work better. Eric Mangini is a very good defensive coach. That's what he is known for. Maybe he just didn't have the right guy managing his coaching that could make it better. Sean Payton, I think, could fix something like that. But even if the new head coach came in and dismissed the defensive coordinator and the offensive coordinator, now if you can keep the position coaches there, if they are well enough, and I think the 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 bright spots that this team had at every position, special teams, uh, receiving, running, blocking, I'm going to say even slight improvements in the O-line as the season progressed is going to be attributed to the coaching they had at those positions. And if that's the case, that's still stability that can keep those the, the, the members and the roster happy and stable that you know they don't have to replace the whole thing and learn everything new and then get to get to know a whole new set of people. You keep you keep the introductions and the inter- and the introductions of new systems to a minimum. So, you know, things can can remain somewhat stable in the background even if, if even if on on screen you're going to see a new head coach on the sidelines and possibly even a new def- a defensive and offensive coordinator on TV. What you don't see are all the position coaches that, you know, are there with the players week in week out doing one-on-ones, doing their sprints, doing their 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 video playbacks, doing all this other mentoring that you don't see ever 
there. So that that can actually work very well if it turns out to be one of those two ways that I actually mentioned. Now, if they come in, if the new head coach comes and cleans house, I don't know if that's going to be the best move. <laughs> that's just my opinion. Um, what else did he mention on this? And I, I think those were like the, the, the very big key notes. Cause again, like once the questions got, got asked, it tended to be the same questions over and over again. He even got asked about how he felt about the perception given to him by, I guess, us, the fans, that he essentially got the backing for Levi Stadium through the hard work of Jim Harbaugh making that team a Super Bowl caliber team with, you know, the, with the work that Jim, that Coach Harbaugh did there, where it was NFC Championship, NFC Championship, no, NFC Championship, Super Bowl, NFC Championship, and then the season that they had. But basically got the funding for this stadium with that hard work. And then once he got the funding and got all that, that he basically just dismissed all of it and said, well, now I got the same that I want. Now, you know, I can cash in and blah, 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 and kind of just took it easy. And again, he didn't get angry about it. He didn't do, he didn't really say anything bad. He simply just stated that, you know, it, it's the business and blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? What, what corporate people are going to say? But he didn't, I don't think he answered any question in a negative light. I mean, he didn't paint roses on it either, but he didn't, he didn't answer any question in an antagonistic way where people can just basically go, what a douche. Outside of the whole Jimmy thing that, that really that really bugged the crap out of me. I I call him a douche for that. But outside of that, he didn't answer any questions, I think, any bad way. And that's pretty much. So he also said that he takes feedback from fans very seriously. Like, he's probably never going to watch this video. I'm pretty sure, almost sure, <laughs> that he's not going to watch this video. But... This is what I want to see from you, Yed York, as the owner of the San Francisco 49ers. First of all, you said that you stay out of social media. You stay, you know, you try to withhold a lot of your emotions. You try to kind of be smart about the way you interact with these media outlets. Keep doing that. If you're, if you're serious, Keep doing that. Stay as far away from Twitter. Stay as far away from Facebook. Especially any type of negative light. If any negative comments that you have to say about your team, your coach, another team, another coach, it doesn't matter. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, those things are just fuel to the negative fire. And that's really the only purpose they serve for a person of your stature. So if you really have done that, continue doing that and stay away from it. <laughs> and unless you're going to go like, oh, you know, great job, you know, great job by the Niners, Niner Nation, whatever. I, I can totally understand that. I respect that. Support your squad when it's time for them to be supported. Perfect. Do that. The other thing is be smart. You you mentioned this in, in the press conference where when asked about the the big cap space you have left or cap room that you have left and your salary cap, you said, just because we have the money doesn't mean we have to spend the money. We have to spend it wisely, you know, to invest and to to roll it over for the next season if that's so if that's the case and it's not just you being cheap. I'm not a businessman, but from a business perspective I can respect that. Why spend money that you don't have to spend? You see it in the NFL. You see it in a lot of a lot of sports teams where they have all this money. They miss out on the big free agent. They miss out on the big coach. They miss out on whatever big thing they want to, you know, a person they want to sign the, the next big superstar. And then they sign a person that's two, three years past their prime, and then they give them the big, huge contract, which winds up just killing the team for the next seven years because they're going to eat all of that salary. 
So again, if that's what you're doing, I respect it. And by all means, continue to be smart with that money. I respect that. The number one thing that I would want from you, and it's something that I haven't seen, I haven't really even seen it, seen mentioned here on this press conference, is stay out of it. Stay completely out of it. Do not take sides. Do not take the side of your head coach. Do not take the side of your players. Do not take the side of your GM. You are the check signer. You hold the ultimate power on this team. What you have shown in the last two seasons that this team has declined since climbing up the ranks of a potential superstar franchise is that you have sided with your GM. Coach Harbaugh did not agree with your methods, did not agree with Ryan Balky's methods. You sided with your GM, and we saw where that led. During the offseason, you decided to hire a coach or to sign a check for a coach that you knew for a fact would not argue and conflict with the wants and needs of your GM. And look where that led, 5-11. and 11. Just as you want to be smart with your money, be smart with your personnel. Hire a coach... Or look at a coach that you know will be a great coach. I don't know how much football experience you have. I'm going to assume growing up in a family, a football family and a sports family, that you have learned, or at least I would hope, that you have learned enough from your years of exposure to the business that you can eyeball and spot potential and a coach that is smart enough and capable enough of coaching your team to a Super Bowl. Now, if your GM doesn't want to sign a particular head coach that you feel very strongly about, Because of possible conflict of personal interest, not conflict of interest, conflict of personal interest, and by that I mean eagle stroking, have him deal with it. You are the owner. If the head coach and GM cannot get along but win Super Bowls, for you and for the fans, that's all that matters. We don't care. That the GM and head coach don't get along. We don't care that the players don't like the head coach. But if they're willing to play for said head coach and win championships, winning solves everything. It has been true through the history of man. It has been true for the history of sports. Whenever conflict arises, winning solves everything even if it's just a short-term solution winning solves everything i'm going to repeat that phrase a couple more times do not take a favorable position in any one of those three things that i just mentioned don't take the side of your head coach don't take the side of your gm or your players. Your position is to eyeball all the talent, players, coaches, and your GM, and figure out who you want to keep paying to do the job that you're paying them to do. If your head coach can cut it, but your GM can't cut it with the head coach, 
fire the GM. If you're, if you have confidence in your GM, but think that the head coach can manage it, fire the head coach. Now, I'm not talking about the last two because that wasn't you lacking confidence in your coaches. That was you giving into the GM. If that's not the case, that is the perception that you are giving currently. You fired Harbaugh over well-documented tiffs of bullshit. You hired Jim Tom Stula, even though I think he's a good coach, maybe even a great coach at his positions that he coached. You hired him because he would not conflict with your GM. Both those times that you let, let go of your coaches in the last two seasons have been because you took the side of your GM. I don't think there was any, there wasn't much personal involvement from you or personal connection with you in those decisions. It was you taking the side of your GM. Now, when it comes to players, you're paying their checks. If you feel for whatever reason you're overpaying somebody, Kaepernick, and they can't cut it anymore, you got to cut them. This is a business. I, I don't like to say that. As a fan, because I love Vernon Davis. I love Frank Gore. Both of those guys have been or were with the franchise pretty much since my son was born. Patrick Willis, he retired. And there, there's others, but th- those are like the main two. And even Alex Smith to, to a lesser degree. And even Alex Smith. Th- those three players in 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 particular have been with the franchise since my child has been born or were with the franchise since my child has been born so watching them play on sunday is sentimental to me and i don't know who felt that they couldn't cut it anymore but you released alex smith you let him go you traded them him to the chiefs you let go of frank gordon even bother re-signing him or from what i could gather even making him an offer to stay as a niner and then traded away Vernon Davis. It hurt me to see them go. Even Alex Smith, it hurt me to see them go. But from a business aspect, I can understand it. And when the Niners made it to the Super Bowl next season, and not to disrespect Alex Smith in any way, but Alex who? It was a Kaepernick show at that point. Even though, looking back, it wasn't even about him. Except, well, whatever, I'm going to stay out of that part. But winning solves everything. You can stomp on the sentiments of the fans, as is this business, and not really just this business, but all the sports business. You can stomp on the sentiments of fans, but if you can win championships and you can make viewing the Niners an enjoyable experience for the fans, winning solves everything. Everything. So you make the cuts that you feel you have to make in order to make this team win. And you can only do that when you look at your franchise, when you look at your team from top to bottom, not just the players, but everyone else between you and them. Objectively and make moves that you and only you consider to be the moves you need to make to make this team win. And that's what I want to see from you. You came out in this press conference and took full responsibility for this failed season. Now be a man about it. Make those moves. That you need to make. Make them and commit to them. You say you're committed to the fans. Commit to your actions. Take responsibility for your actions. Make sure. That the failures that you are taking responsibility for. Are your failures. And not the failures of somebody else in your franchise. Who you are scapegoating from. 
Be real with yourself and be real with us. And we'll be there. Because winning solves everything. That's how I'm going to end it. Damn, this is long. <laughs> so thank you guys for watching. Uh, I know I tend to get long-winded and say a bunch of crap when I come to talk about my Niners in, in video games. But you know what? I love this team, and I'm not going to say this is the last time I talk about them because I'm pretty sure when they announce a new head coach, I'm going to be back and talk some more stuff. Um, but, yeah, thank you guys for watching once again. And I will see you guys, I guess, in the next announcement, whenever that announcement comes. Have fun. If I don't talk to you guys during the playoffs, have a fun playoff viewing season. Have fun at, uh, watching the Super Bowl because I will be watching most of those games and the Super Bowl. And um, I look forward to talking to you guys pretty soon. So this has been Mr. KB. See you guys next time. Bye.